All right, great. You want to stand up? We're going to sing and praise God today. Are you ready to praise Jesus? Oh, that was weak. Are you ready to praise Jesus today? Mark 11.10 says, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Glory to God in the highest. Amen.
good. Can I get a big amen? amen?
The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. this thing on? All right. (laughs) 
So a few months ago, I was blessed with the opportunity to help out with a day camp at Oil Belt Christian Service Camp with some younger kids, and that was a pretty interesting experience, as I'm sure it always is. It's a great feeling to talk to these kids and to show them who you think Jesus is and to bring them close to him the best that you can, even while they're young. When the kids arrived in the morning, we each gave, we gave them each these colored cinch bags that helped us divide up what team they were on at a tell help us organize them throughout the day. Now, a lot of them brought their swimsuits, their towels, and their Bibles in a bag already, but some of them carried them in their arms or just shoved them in the bags when they got there. Later on in the day, when it came time for us to change and go get go swimming, I noticed a little boy, and he was sobbing, crying, really. And he walked up to me, held up an empty cinch bag, and told me that he lost his swimsuit and towel, and they were in another bag. As I was trying to calm him down, and point out to him that the other boys just need to change and I would help him go find his bag, I noticed another bag that he was wearing on his back. Inside that bag was his swimsuit, his towel, and his Bible. <laughs> now, as silly as that story sounds, it's easy for us to just brush, us off, brush it off and not really think twice about it. But I think God speaks to us through coincidence. Whenever it came time for me to think about what I was doing for this communion service, God really waited on my mind and when you think about it, the empty bag can represent figuratively in our life the things that we let control us, our lustful thoughts, money. It could be our job. It could be school for those who are younger. Those things are important sometimes, but when you, if you die tonight, I don't think God cares too much what your GPA is or what job you've held. If we take a moment to relate to that child, we can see how God works and these little things because we held up our empty bag we throw Jesus behind us and forget that he's there but if we'll take just a moment to stop focusing on this empty bag that doesn't hold anything that's really valuable to us in life and we notice the bag on our back that holds Jesus that's the eternal life that we need and that's what really matters in the long run no matter what hardships you're going through right now Jesus is there even when you forget about him we put him on the back burner all the time. But Jesus never leaves. He's always there. Now, there's this verse in the book of Deuteronomy, and I think a lot of people start reading the Old Testament. They'll get on the book of Genesis, and you'll really just go straight. You're going through the creation, get to Exodus. It's the story of the Israelites. Everything's going well. Get to Leviticus. Things start slowing down. And then you get to the book of Numbers, and that's where most people fall off, I think. But if you keep reading, there's verses like this in the book of Deuteronomy that says, know, know therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Even those insignificant books in the Bible, or not really insignificant, but may seem insignificant to us, I think God hides verses like that in there if we're really willing to research and look into those rather slow books compared to some of the more fast-paced things in the Bible. Let's take a moment and pray that we remember God is faithful. Pray that we remember God is that full bag that's on our back. God, I thank you for all the people in this room. Thank you for every Sunday that we get the opportunity to come here to be close to you. Thank you that we get the opportunity that you're always there. You're always on our back, even when we focus on things of this life that simply aren't important and won't matter in the grand scheme of things, Lord. Thank you that you're the same God today, tomorrow, and forever. Pray that in this communion time, we just remember that you are God, and we examine our own lives, see what that empty bag is for us right now. Let us find you, the, the full bag that's on our back. In your house, and send me pray. Amen.
20 years. 20 years. About 20, there we go. <laughs> About 20 years ago and one day today, America fell under the largest attack in our nation's history. On that day, thousands of lives were lost and hundreds of heroes emerged. Let's take a moment to thank God for those who survived the attacks and to mourn for those who were lost that day. God, thank you that even when dark smoke rises against the sky, that you're still God. We thank you, Lord, that you stay faithful even in the toughest of times, God. I pray that we can live each day like it's December 12th, I mean, not December, <laughs> September 12th, where we stay in unity. And after that, those attacks, it didn't matter if you were black or white. It didn't matter how much money you had. What matters is that you were in this country and you mourned with everyone else. Thank you, God, for the days to come and thank you God that hopefully the worst is behind us and that we pray nothing like that ever has to happen again. You know, the sense name we pray. Amen. Second Kings chapter 13. We're going to do a little Bible reading this morning. We're going to tell you the story of Elisha. We're going to finish up with Elisha. We started about uh, eight weeks ago, seven weeks ago, back in the end of July and we looked at Elisha as a young man. By the way, this has been a good day today. Good day. Jason, thanks for those words. Thanks for that, uh, that rattling song. We're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But we talked about Elisha as a young man who gave his heart to God. He was out plowing a field when Elijah called him to follow. He jumped in. He, remember, he burnt the plows, killed the, co killed the cows, and jumped in all in and began to serve God. We've seen amazing miracles. Uh, dead boy raised, a leper cured. We've seen God do all kinds of things. Today we look at the last chapter of his life. Chapter 13, verse 14 says this. When Elisha was in his last illness, probably over 80 years old, he's coming to his last illness, and someday you too will have your last illness. That's pretty good news. Anybody with that? Someday you'll have your last illness. It won't, won't be ill forever. And we're going to focus on his last days. I don't know what you want in your last days. I, when I signed up for Medicare... I sign up for the least possible coverage because I'm cheap. Okay, I'm just cheap. That's all there is to that. And I'm in, I, I think, in good health. I think I, I feel good. I think I have good health. And she said, yes, of course, everybody thinks they're going to live to be 105 years old and die in their sleep, feeling good. And that's my, I hope that I will die in my sleep, wake up in heaven in the morning and feel good until I get there. But I, and when she said that, it reminded me of this old joke and that you will just bear with me with, okay? Just live through this one. Guy said, I want to I die peacefully in my sleep like my grandpa did, okay? Not screaming in terror like the passengers in his car. Did I mess that up? No, that's funny. I, I, I don't, that, anyway. <clears throat> very good. Thank you. Very, I'm, I'm lost now. Not easy. Uh, getting old is not easy, uh, but he is, Elisha is a man who has the, finishes strong. Here's a sobering thought. If you are, for most of us, and this is young, a young crowd, okay, but for most of us, most of the funerals I preach, people are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, okay, most people. And occasionally, yesterday there was one for a guy who was 53 years old, and, and that's a little different. But for most of us, you'll get to 60, 70, 80, or 90, and the people who go to your funeral will probably not have only known you for about 10 or 20 years. You ever think about that? But my dad's funeral was last year. He was 93. Everybody, nobody knew him when he was a kid. All the people who knew him when he was a kid were, were gone. So what we know about people, what we remember is what happened in those last years of life. So it's important that you finish well. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Remember, Elisha gave his life. The time of my death is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. The prize isn't just for me. It's for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And Jesus said in Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death. He'll give you the crown of life. So don't quit too early. We'll look at Elisha's legacy of faith and, and what I want in my last days. 
Some of you think, well, that could be any minute, right? First Kings 13, 14. Here's the, the way the story starts. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel, he cried. That's odd, the chariots and charioteers. A couple references earlier to that. Remember when Elijah went to heaven in a, in a chariot? Elisha said, behold, the chariot of Israel, the, the fiery chariot. And another time, Elisha said, open their eyes they can, that they can see all these fiery chariots, this war wagon that God has. And he's thinking about it. The king now is thinking about Elisha as the chariot and charioteers of Israel. Here's my lesson. In my last days, I still want to be a friend to sinners. In my last days, I want those who don't know God to, to know and to believe that I care about them, even if they don't care about God. And that's the truth about this king. The king was saddened by the approaching death of Elisha, but he was not a, really a godly man. 1 Kings 13 tells his story. Verse 10 says he became king. Verse 11 says, Johash did not uh, do what was evil in the Lord's sight, refused to turn from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, that he led Israel to commit. Basically, it goes back to the beginning of Israel's history. He said this guy set up a, a, a pagan altar, and even this man, Jehoash, continues to worship at that pagan altar. He doesn't worship God like he ought to. He doesn't take God seriously, but he's saddened when the man of God is about to die, and he comes with tears. He has a soft spot in his heart for Elisha. So he comes and he weeps openly over him. And the king must have thought, Elisha's my friend, and we're losing an important part of our culture. He must have remembered the, the victories that came. Dig the ditches and I'll fill with water. He must remember the, the victories that God gave through Elisha. And he said, this is going to be terrible when Elisha's gone. We're really going to miss him. I wonder if the non-believers around us see us as their friend. Now, I, I, a slogan we use at church sometimes and that is, Mount Carmel wants to be the best, Parkview wants to be the best friend Mount Carmel has ever had. I, I like that. So I want Parkview Christian Church to be the best friend that Mount Carmel has ever had. And listen, there are people in town who don't believe in God at all. Okay? I want them to think, I'm glad Parkview's here. I want them to see the benefit that, that we gather on wor for worship and we encourage each other because we're making a difference. Even though they don't believe, we're still making a difference in their lives. Does that, does that make sense? That's how this king felt about it. He wasn't a worshiper of God particularly, but he knew that Elisha being there was good for everybody. People who don't love God, hear me, are not our enemies. We want to be their friend. You know what our enemy is? Ephesians 6.12 says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers, authorities, and the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places, our enemy is Satan. Now, sometimes people are used by our enemy. Some people are directly opposed to God and what he has to say in his word. They're being used by the enemy, but they're not the enemy. And that's important. Remember, we want to be, I want to be in my, in my last days, in this day, which could be my last day, I want to be a friend to those who are opposed to God, those who are not right with him. And I say that because in our culture, there's so much angry talk, okay? And listen, I believe what the Bible teaches. I do, and I'm not, I'm not going to back up on that. I, I believe what the Bible teaches about sexuality. I believe what the Bible teaches about the, the value of human life. Those things are ingrained in the Scriptures. I'm never going to back up on those. those things, certain things are always going to be right. Certain things are always going to be wrong. But I want to be able to say that in a way that doesn't make everybody else think I hate them. And often, what we post on our social media accounts and what way we campaign for our ideas is, is it's not that what we're saying isn't correct. It, it's the way we say it. It makes it so other people can't come to Jesus. And the goal is to be a friend of sinners so they can be a friend of Jesus. The goal is not to get my agenda passed in Washington, though that would be fine. Wouldn't we all be happier if we did, th did things my way? That's not the goal. The goal is that I don't want to do anything in promoting an agenda or my belief that would make it hard for people to come to Christ. Does that make sense? Sometimes we are so mean-spirited, people can't come to him. You know what they said about Jesus? Matthew chapter 11, they said he's a, he's a, wine, a wine drinker, and he is a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. 
Has anybody ever accused you of being a friend of sinners? In my last days, I still want to be a friend of sinners. I'm going to tell you two stories about my friend Nathan Schnauz. And now Nate died about four years ago. First story is this. When his dad died, his dad was a famous, uh, famous, locally famous preacher. Preached over in Clay Illinois. Used to preach up by Lawrenceville. And was a great singer and saxophone player and led revivals, probably thousands of revivals across southern Illinois particularly, where he would lead the worship and somebody else would preach and he'd preach and somebody else would lead worship. Great guy. He also had a starter alternator business in his home. Now, on the, on the, attached to the home was a shed. And back in those days when Larry was alive, when I had a starter alternator problem, you can go to AutoZone and get one for $100 or $150, or you can go to Larry Schnauz. I went to Larry Schnauz. And I would go there. I'd, you'd have to take your own alternator. He said, I'm not taking your alternator off. You've got to bring the alternator. He'd put it on the machine, on the shop there, in the, the, on the, you know what I'm talking about, on the bench, on the deal. And he'd take that thing apart and he'd go, oh, it's a diode, triode, miode, keode. And he'd throw that on the floor, take that out. And he would have, and then you look on the floor for another old alternator. And he'd go down there, he'd take the piece out there and stick it back on. And, and he'd say, I need $20. And you'd be back in business. Now, he did that for a lot of people, not just preachers, he did it for a lot of people. He did it for all the farmers and all the local oil guys around Clay City. And when he died, great funeral, big celebration of his life. And Nate Schnauz said the best part of it was this. All those guys my dad did business with who didn't love Jesus and don't go to church came to the funeral because my dad was their friend. I want to be, in my last days, I want to be a friend to sinners. Verse 15. Here the story goes on. Elisha told the king, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands, and the king commanded, open the eastern window. And he opened it, and he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow, and Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram. You will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. That's an odd story. Here's, here's my second Nate Schnout story. Nate uh, suffered from bone cancer in his hip. And I've, several times in his dying days, I got to go visit with, with Nate. One time, and usually the other people, are, one time it was just Nate and I in the house. And we were talking and we're, you know, we're sharing our faith and trying to encourage each other. And he was in a lot of pain. And he looked out this glass double door into the yard. And right out in the yard, there was a groundhog. And Nate said, I've been after that groundhog for a long time. Dying man. He said, get my gun. <laughs> uh, okay. So I went over and I got his gun down and gave him this rifle. And he said, open the door and cover your ears. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Nate stood up on one, one leg and fired from the house. From, are you with me? From inside the house. And missed the groundhog. <laughs> I thought that was unusual because I was raised by people. <laughs> and that's not the way we normally behave. Well, that, that's kind of that's, that's a weird story. It's kind of what's going on with Elisha and the king. King Jehoash comes and Elisha says, get your bow and arrow. Uh, we're in the house. <laughs> All right. And he puts his hands. He gets around that, that king. He puts his hands on the bow, puts his hands on the arrow. He's getting ready to fire that thing, old quivering hands with the quiver. And he said, open a window. And he shoot, shoot east toward Aram because God is going to give you a great victory. God's not done. In my last days, I still want to be thinking about the future. I still want to have faith in God for what's going to happen and be hopeful for the future. He's old and dying, still thinking about tomorrow. He offers a gift to the king, a promise of victory. You're going to have victory when you go down there. Elisha knew he wouldn't be around for it. Remember Martin Luther King Jr. saying, I may not get there with you, but we're headed to the mountaintop. And that's what Elisha saying to the king. We're, we're going to, you're going to have great victory. God's going to give you victory. I won't be there with you, but it's going to be okay. It's easy when you get old to become nostalgic and think only about the good old days when you weren't old. Okay? But this king, is, he's not, he's not, Elisha's not falling for that. He said, I may be old, and I may not be here very long, but I know God has great things in store, great things in the future, and God has good things planned. We've been talking all this series about the greater things Elisha would do and the greater things that God wants us to do to be involved in his work. 
Let me remind you of the promise of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your toil is not in vain in the Lord. God has something good for you in the future. I want my life, I want to, in my last days, to make ripples that will last for a long time. Romans 16, 20, one of my favorite verses. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That means I am somebody. We get to do his work. I don't know how many of you have a will. Just by show of hands, how many of you have, have a will written? This is a young crowd. Just okay, raise your hand and be proud. I don't have one yet myself. Okay, I, what, what do we think? Well, I don't have much to leave. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Won't be much of a fight over that. If you have a will, and if you're thinking about writing a will, and some of you ought to write a will. I heard that on TV. I hope you'll include something about faith in there. When my dad died last year, we read the will. I was a little saddened because I was supposed to share equally with all three sisters. You'd have thought I would have got the lion's share of that, but I did not. But the best, that was a joke, enjoy. The best part of the will was my dad took the time to write out his wishes for us. And it had something to do with money and take the money and do all this, but... What he said, the most important thing he said was this. The most important thing in my life is my faith in Jesus Christ. And I want each of you, I'm praying that each of you will live the rest of your lives for Jesus. And then he said, be nice to each other and don't fight about the money. That's pretty good. And I think those kind of things should be said. And Elisha is telling the king, hey, in the future, I want you to have faith in God because God can do great things. He's not done. The man of God is leaving the scene. And God had given victories through Elisha. But he said, God will still be here. There are victories to be had. Verse 18. If you're even a stranger. Now he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up, struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. And then you would have had, had beaten Aram until he was entirely destroyed. Now he'd be victorious only three times. In my last days, I still want to call people to repentance and commitment. It's a little tricky. Elisha just says, strike the ground, and the king takes a, the arrows and strikes the ground three times. How many times did you have struck the ground? Ah, he just said, strike the ground three times. And then Elisha is mad at him, and I think the reason is this. He realizes that all the king is doing is placating the old man. He doesn't have, his own, he doesn't have faith in God. He, he's not believing in the victory. He's just trying to... He just thinks the old man's a little wacky. The old man's lost it. And a lot of people just go through the motions. They do the minimum. They're not really serious about God. And the king loved Elisha, and Elisha loved the king enough to call him to repentance and to call him to commitment and to be serious about God. And what he basically says is don't rob yourself of the blessing God wants to give. I'm afraid a lot of people come to church because they've got to instead of because they get to. Elisha's leaving a gift for the king, a valuable thing of faith in God. He knew this verse set in Chronicles 16. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I want to call people that way as well. I want to remind you of Mark 8, 35. Jesus said, if you hang on to your life, you'll lose it. Give it up for my sake and for the good news, you will save it. Back in 1949, Jack Rum was an unemployed Man, he was walking along the beach, and a, this is a true story. Bottle washed up on the beach. He opened it. There was paper inside. And the paper said this I leave my entire estate to the lucky person who finds this bottle and to my attorney, Barry Cohen, share and share alike, signed Daisy Alexander, June 20th, 1937, 12 years prior. What would you do if you picked up a bottle and there was a, something? Like, how many of you would think, well, that's probably a scam? I got an email the other day from CVS asking me to take a survey. Anybody get this email? I thought, well, I'll take it. And they offered me a $90 gift card. I thought, well, for $90, I'll give you 10 minutes. So I went through the survey. And then survey, at the end, there are these prizes. Pick the prize you want. Well, I picked the iPad. And to get the iPad, you've got to send in $2.99 for shipping and handling. Now, I'm old. I'm not that old. Now, if that works for you, let me know. We'll share the iPad. But I, I thought to myself, this is just a scam. A- am I right? I kept the 299 
and felt bad about the 10 minutes. I, I wonder, would you, if you picked up this bottle with a note in it, would you think, well, this is just a scam? Or would you take it seriously? Well, he took it seriously. He went to the lawyer, and when he found out that this, in fact, was the last will and testament of Daisy Singer Alexander of the Singer Sewing Machine people, he inherited half her estate. He received, at the time he turned the will in, $56 million. And because of the stock, he also received $80,000 a year for the rest of his life. My point is, you got to be willing to warn our friends and neighbors, you have to take Jesus seriously. Now, I, I know when you tell about Jesus, people are going to say, ah, that's too good to be true. I think it's a scam. Well, maybe, but there's another possibility. And you owe it to them to say, you need to check this out for yourself. If they reject Jesus, they really miss the good thing. Here's the last part of the story, verses 20 and 21. We've been singing this song since Easter. It goes like this. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha. Remember, remember that? Here it is. Here are the bones of Elisha, verse 20. Elisha died and was buried. Thanks for not laughing. <laughs> Groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once, when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders. They hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. As soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. In my last days... Elisha, I want to still be pointing people to resurrection power. That's a really odd story, but it's about the fact that God's declaring there's power over the grave. I, that, that, that song we sing, that resurrection song, that Elisha bone song, that, it's good news. This week, our friend, Trisha's brother-in-law, Dave O'Lear, passed from this life at the tender age of 60. I, always, I hate it when people younger than me die because then I realize I'm old. But we believe, and I want to pass, I want to keep pointing people to the power of the resurrection. And Trish, you don't mind if I tell this. Sherry is a nurse over at the hospital at Evansville, and they used to be in church here and before they moved over there. She said this watched a lot of people go through this in their lives, they watched a lot of people die in the hospital. There's a tremendous difference between those with faith in Jesus and those without faith in Jesus. And I want to keep pointing people to resurrection power. Hebrews 2, listen to this. Because, of God, because God's children, human beings, made a flesh. Son of man became flesh and blood. Only as a human being could he die. Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. He rose so we could rise as well. 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, it gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 4, brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who die, so you will not grieve like those who have no hope. We grieve when people die. We can't help it. We're tied to them, and we can't get a hold of them anymore, and they're gone from here, and we grieve. But we do not grieve like those who have no hope. We grieve as those who have great hope in the future. Interesting, the corpse they threw into the grave of Elisha, when it touched the bones of Elisha, God put new life back into those bones. It makes me think about baptism, the Bible, what it says. When we touch him, he gives us life. Romans 6, 3. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism... We joined him in his death. We died and we were buried with Christ in, his ba in baptism. We touched his bones in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the glorious power of the Father, we also may live new lives. Christians have new life now, better life, and the best life to come. Throw him on the bones of Elisha. Don't get the wrong idea. Some of you have been looking at me all morning thinking, he's about to croak, isn't he? <laughs> well, I don't think so. But I don't know that. I don't know. I, I know that the window of opportunity for living is short. I know I have a few days here. I, I mean, listen, this may be my last day. This may be, or I, I may live <laughs> and torment you for another 40 years. Either way, I'm all right with that. But I want to make my life count. I want to make my days or left count. I want to be a friend to sinners. I want to be hopeful about the future. 
I want to call people to follow God, repent, and realize resurrection power. Come and play for me if you would, please. Tom Long is a well-known professor, seminary professor of preaching at Princeton University. You may have heard of Princeton. He went back uh, to the church he preached at when he was a kid, which is always a little bit of a different experience. And he went back and he looked for a guy that he knew well, and his daughter was there. I said, well, hate to say this, but dad died last year. But he said, she said, I've got to tell you about how dad died, about his dying moments, the deathbed of Elisha. She said, we were gathered around, uh, my brother and I. And dad had, was past the point where he, could, he just couldn't speak anymore. But he began to point to the bathroom. And finally, we realized he wants something on the bathroom. <laughs> and he pointed, and, and they, they finally realized he, he wants a glass of water. And they brought the glass of water to dad. He said, no, not me. And he pointed to my, to my brother. And one of my brother to take, take a drink. And then he pointed to me. And then he pointed to himself. He said, we realized in his last hour, dad's serving communion. He's trying to remind us of what's really important. You know what? And he died within an hour of that. I wouldn't mind going like that. Oh, I'd rather just die peacefully in my sleep and wake up in heaven. But I hope that my last days, that my every day will point people to him. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to sing. If you need to make a decision for Christ, you can come to the front. We'll help you do that. If you'd rather do that later, you can talk to us. But you need to live for him. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all. To him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior. As I look over this group of people, these are a lot of young people, and it seems like a long way away to our last days. Father, I think my last days are a long way away, too. But Father, in the meantime, help us to live every day as if eternity counted on it, because we know it does. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Parkview, and thank you for coming to church today. I have a few announcements for you. So first off, the Rooted Women's Ministry will be having another one-hour praise and worship event. This will be held on September 25th from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Legion Building. This event is for women ages 18 and up, and we encourage all women, whether younger or older, to come join us and encourage each other in your relationship with Jesus Christ. The new adult Sunday school class that's led by the Belts and the Stevensons has now been changed to begin meeting on Sunday, September 19th, and will be meeting in the Kids Church area. They are going to be going over Francis Chan's study on the book of James. If you are interested, make sure to contact Natalie Stevenson for more information. Last but not least, we have a few youth group announcements. So our fourth and fifth graders will be meeting here at the church from five to 6.30. Our junior hires will be meeting at the Legion Building, 5 to 6.30, and the high schoolers will be meeting also at the Legion Building from 6 to 
The junior high and high schoolers will be going over Romans chapter 3 tonight, both reading it and studying it. So make sure to be at one of those events if you are in those age groups. All right, that's all I have for you today and have a lovely, wonderful week.